us know the names and the powerful literature of authors such as Alice Walker, Phyllis Wheatley, Henrik Ibsen, Frederick Douglass, Upton Sinclair, Mary Wollstonecraft, and Azar Nafizi. Nafizi is the author of Reading Lolita in Tehran, and she visited MC last year as part of this Athenaeum Symposia to discuss her work. All of these authors, and many others, have bravely used their pen to expose societal problems to a national or international audience. Their works created debate which often led to growth and change. Nadia Hashimi stands among these leaders. Nadia's family gives her much inspiration. Her parents left Afghanistan in the 1970s before the invasion of the Soviet Union, and Nadia was born in New York. Nadia has recently even written a semi-fictional piece describing the horrific day when Soviet forces invaded Afghanistan, and how her parents chose to leave their homeland in an effort to evade the devastation there and begin a new, safer life in an unfamiliar, faraway country. Her mother and father were remarkable individuals to make this brave journey. Her mother pursued a master's degree in civil engineering, and her father worked very hard to build a great life for their extended family in the US. That extended family keeps the Afghan culture vibrant and integral to Nadia's life. Additionally, Nadia's great-grandmother was a notable Afghan poet, and that eloquence definitely pulses through Nadia's veins and keystrokes today. Nadia earned college degrees in biology and Middle Eastern studies at Brandeis University. She attended medical school in Brooklyn and completed her pediatric training at NYU and Bellevue hospitals. And throughout her, her demanding medical training, she stayed actively involved in the Afghan American culture in New York. A powerful experience, especially the days following 9-11. After she completed her rigorous and time-consuming medical training, she explored her passion for writing, and she's developed a unique blending of her love of family, her interest in her parents' and grandparents' home country, and her ability to create complex and heartfelt characters. Certainly, her artistry with words brings to life characters in warm, vital families. And Nadia situates these families in difficult circumstances, and, and um, some facing political oppression, domestic abuse, judicial indifference, and cruelty and hatred from others around them. Sometimes, as in the case of my favorite one of her characters, Rahima, the price of safety and freedom is giving up one's own identity. Through such characters, we as readers can feel the sting of injustice. Today, Nadia lives in Maryland with her husband and is a practicing pediatrician. She travels the country and the world discussing her book's important topics so relevant today. I am particularly touched by Nadia's realistic female characters who are blamed instead of congratulated for having daughters and who sacrifice their own dignity and hope and freedom in order to satisfy the people around them. I am very fortunate to teach women in literature and women's studies here at Montgomery College and my literature students are currently reading and discussing The Pearl That Broke Its Shell. We have all been transfixed by the tradition of Bacha Posh uh, featured in the story. I'm sure Nadia Shimi will talk more about this, but Bacha Posh is a tradition in which young girls dress as boys and are called sons by family, members, and neighbors until they reach marrying age. As a boy, they can walk, run, play, and look others directly in the eyes without being limited, unsupervised, or shamed for being a girl who may possibly attract male attention and therefore bring so-called shame upon their family. Nadia's books courageously and directly expose how women are treated as objects to be given away or used, who are condemned to criticism or deprivation for not giving birth to healthy sons, who are physically and emotionally abused by family, even to the point in one of her characters, Harwin case, of seeing suicide as the only escape to peace, who are expected to work physically hard without pay or respect, and whose mothers-in-law rule them completely. Her latest book, A House Without Windows, was released only a month ago in August of this year. It addresses women being imprisoned in Afghanistan for so-called crimes of immorality. Given her insight on the stinging problems affecting women around the world today, we are very fortunate to have Nadia Hashimi here to talk about her books, her inspiration, and even how a practicing doctor becomes a successful novelist. So please join me in welcoming Nadia Hashimi. Thank you for that very, very warm introduction. I'm really glad to be here. I'm grateful to be invited to, um, to be a speaker as part of the symposium and to have a chance to speak with all of you here in this room. So thanks for taking your lunch break or whatever break this is between classes and spending this time to talk about the lives of Afghan women. Um, you heard a little bit about why I've started writing about Afghan women. It's because my family comes from Afghanistan. 
And because we kind of have an idea of what's been happening in Afghanistan's history in the past few years, there's been a lot of war. And in the context of that war, one of the big losers uh, were the women, and particularly the women's rights. And that tends to happen in the, in the case of war. So I grew up with a mother who had an Afghanistan and painted a picture of an Afghanistan where she was able to go to school, where she was able to dress as she pleased, whether that was Western clothing or otherwise. And she was able to pursue a degree in education, in specifically in engineering. Now, that's not the Afghanistan we think of when we see images on the media or when we think of you know, what's been portrayed over the past 30 plus years. So for me, to reconcile growing up and seeing these blue burqa clad women with the pictures and images that my parents had created for me, the lives that they had left behind, that was something I always paid attention to and kind of wanted to figure out how something like this could happen. So I want to give a little bit of background. Before 9-11, I will tell you that people would ask me, you know, where are you from? Where is your family from? And especially being in New York, that was always a question. And I would say Afghanistan. And people would kind of give me this dazed over look and, and say, well, is that in Africa? You know, is that in Europe? Where is that? Nobody had heard of Afghanistan. Now, post 9-11, that was really, really different. And for a little while after 9-11, it wasn't good until people kind of figured out who was what and which side was the bad guys and what was happening there. And then everyone sort of rallied around the cause of the Afghan woman. And, and that's when everyone sort of started to pay attention to this thing that, I had, that had been eating me up inside were these women who were so oppressed during the time of the Taliban. So when you think of an Afghan woman, most people think of this, which is just a shape. It's a cloud. It's this sh blue shadow that kind of passes in the background, and it's anonymous, and it really has no power. But there are lots of different kinds of Afghan women. And, um, and this is one of our pop stars, who is very bold and very outspoken. And people would sometimes be surprised when they see images of her. And to be honest, when I introduced myself as an Afghan woman, a lot of people would be surprised. And they would say, well, I didn't know that's what an Afghan woman looked like. And when I said, well, what did you think an Afghan woman looked like? There were crickets chirping, because nobody had any idea. So we, we know why we talk about this. It's because I want to know how we go from, and this is not my mother in any of these pictures, but we want to know how we go from this to this. I think this is what most people think of when you think of Afghanistan, and specifically when you think about the Taliban control of Afghanistan. And so this is my, the legacy that I've grown up with, was hearing stories like this. Um, I'll give you just a really, really brief history. This is not a history course, but I'll tell you just very briefly. So my parents grew up in the 1960s into the 1970s, and that was sort of this golden age, particularly for women. There was a lot of move towards modernization and progression in Afghanistan until, um, and there was a big sort of socialist move in Afghanistan. And then that kind of came to a head in 1979 when there was a conservative element that rose up against the incoming Soviet movement. And in, when the Soviets entered and there was an occupation, then there, that turned into a war. Uh, once the Soviets withdrew, we then have sort of this vacuum in Afghanistan. All of a sudden, nobody's in control, and the country falls into a state of civil war. Between 1996 and 2001, you have the Taliban days. And one female parliamentarian in Afghanistan I recently spoke to described it as the darkest days. She worked as a gynecologist. These were the only women who were allowed to work outside of the home during the Taliban time period. And so she, clad in her burqa, would go off to the hospitals. And she said, with the Taliban over her shoulder and at her ankles. Uh, women were banned from school. They were banned from work otherwise. They were banned from public appearances. They couldn't see male physicians. So that's why the only people they could see were female physicians. Nail polish was banned for under the threat of having fingernails pulled out. The sound of a woman laughing could not be heard. Heels could not be heard. Windows were painted so that a woman couldn't accidentally be seen. Fast forward to uh, post 9-11 a move to oust the Taliban, and now by 2004, we have a new constitution that's establishing equal rights for women, and women are again given the right to vote. So there's a pretty quick turnaround with what women can do, but we still have a culture that we have to deal with, and so we still have a patriarchal society that believes that boys and girls are not necessarily equal. And from that, and that's something that predated all these wars, we have the Bachaposh tradition. So that's one of the themes of my first novel, The Pearl That Broke Its Shell. 
And what about Chaposhes as a child who is transformed into a boy? Families do this because there is a superstitious belief that if you do not have sons in your family, then certainly you are lacking that source of pride. But what we can do is transform one of our daughters into a son, and then there's a belief that the next child naturally born into the family will be a true son. And then the family's honor and pride will be restored. And this is something that happens in a young child. There are no hard and fast rules, but the general rules are such. The, the girl has all of the rights, freedoms, liberties that are afforded to a young boy, and she is accepted by the greater society as well. So some individuals may know this is actually a boy and go along with it. Some may not know and just ex, you know, don't even ask any questions because they assume. These children should go back to their natural gender of being a girl before they hit puberty because past that age, it's really not appropriate for them to be playing around or horsing around with members of the opposite gender and specifically with boys. Um, and this is a practice that has been talked about before. It's been um, discussed in movies and in a children's book called The Breadwinner. So this is a theme that comes up, and I think it's a really good way, and that's why I used it, of exploring the gender inequality and the, and the, the way the ingenious methods that people use to get around these uh, gender restrictions in that kind of a society. It's not unique to Afghanistan. There are other kinds of things that happen in other places of the world. And I always think these photographs of the sworn virgins of Albania, and there are more of them from this photographer, are really striking. And these are individuals who uh, become members of the opposite sex. They become men, but they do that lifelong. Um, so it's a little bit different, but the roots of the tradition are the same. This is also sort of dying out. So why do people do this? Well, because in a patriarchal society, and all of our societies have very patriarchal roots, sons trump daughters. Now, that's a kind of an ugly way to say it, so, and we're in a blue state, so I can make this comment, but. So, because sons are valued over daughters. And this is something we see over and over again. It's in our stories, it's in our legacies, and this is not something unique to the Afghan culture. If we look at many other cultures, there is a value that's placed on sons that is not exactly there for daughters. It's changing, but we have to admit that that's the starting point. And why not, right? Sons are pretty awesome. I have two sons of my own. That's not them. <laughs> that's not them either. And that's not them either. But. Daughters are also pretty awesome, and I think we're starting to recognize that as well, right? And so we're starting to see more people holding up their daughters uh, and, and showing off their daughters' talents, their achievements, and recognizing that they have a value outside of uh, providing children and providing heirs. What happens in Afghanistan is because the patriarchy is so deeply rooted is that we have an impression that a son brings honor to his father by virtue of his very existence. So the moment he's born, he is held up the way the Lion King is you know, holding up his offspring. Whereas on the other hand, a daughter is at constant risk of dishonoring her father from day one. And so it's always a step of, you know, what, what is she going to do? Is she going to stay out too late? Is she going to be seen um, with the wrong people? That kind of an impression. The reputation being so key. So we start to look at what are the lives of Afghan women like. The average woman in Afghanistan has about five children. Family planning is not widely available. It's not widely practiced. This puts a huge burden not only on families but on women. And mortality rates are high as well because you couple this high birth rate with very poor access to health care, specifically when you leave the cities. Many women are illiterate. The adult literacy rate in Afghanistan is around 37 to 38%. It is lower than that for women. It will be even lower in villages and in the outlying areas. And we know that literacy also, illiteracy impedes access to healthcare and it affects a family's overall well-being. And a good chunk of women experience some form of abuse or forced marriage. Now there's arranged marriage and then there's forced marriage and they're not the same. And not all arranged marriages are bad. They happen in other cultures as well. So some arranged marriages will work out very well. Um, but forced marriage and that loss of autonomy, that decision-making process is a whole other story. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So 
So we've touched a little bit on the, the situation for girls and the kind of the underlying patriarchy in that Bachaposh tradition, which is what uh, I use to talk about the situation of women as a whole in Afghanistan in The Pearl That Broke Its Shell, my first novel. I'm going to talk a little bit about another scenario that I use sort of as a metric for the women's rights in Afghanistan. And this is something that I use for the, the themes and the, the plots of um, my latest novel, which is A House Without Windows that was mentioned. And a lot of the research for this book, and that's one of the really, really fun and interesting things of writing a novel, is that you know, as much as it may be fiction, my work is deeply rooted in reality. And so I do my due diligence to make sure that the stories that I'm portraying, that the information that I'm conveying has uh, has background, is able to give you solid information. And so for this, I do a, a good amount of research. For this book specifically, there is a Human Rights Watch report that I used. And Heather Barr has been really generous, not only with this report that's widely available on the internet, but she's also been very available to me with interviews and reviewing my manuscript, manuscript as we kind of went forward. And what this book is about is partly a woman who's accused of murdering her husband, but when she goes to prison, she meets other women who are there who are imprisoned for crimes of immorality. And that's something that when I started to learn about, it kind of made me angry to know that a woman could be imprisoned for crimes of immorality, that she could be sentenced for a crime of immorality, and that that could be so widespread that in some cases, it may say that she ran away from an abusive home. Well, there you go. She shouldn't have run away from home. She could be put into prison. Sometimes she may be accused of having a relationship outside of marriage or having an, an inappropriate relationship with a man that she's not married to. And all of these kind of fall into this lump term of crimes of immorality. And so when I hear about these things, I get really, really angry. And as we were just talking about in the corner, uh, I don't know what to do with that anger, so I write stories. And it's cheaper than therapy. That's what I do. So in this Human Rights Watch report, what Heather Barr did was that she interviewed 58 women and girls. She went to three different women's prisons and three juvenile rehab centers. And she spoke with prison wards, with legal experts, activists, um, government officials, prosecutors, and, and tried to get a, um, a good taste of what was happening throughout the justice system. And so one of the things that it's important to make clear is that running away is not a crime under the Afghan Penal Code. As Heather has discussed with me, Afghanistan actually has a very decent procedural code, has a very decent penal code and set of laws that, that do support the equality of women. But running away is still a crime in this society as a whole. And at, at one point, the Afghan Supreme Court did deem it a crime. And so that's where the problem is. And, and what we see is that the police officers who sometimes we feel like are not able to prosecute crimes in Afghanistan, what, what Heather's impression was that when it comes to a woman leaving her home or running away from home, they become very, very capable, and they're able to track her down on the other side of the country. Um, I will just, as a side note, the photographs that you're seeing are from a photographer who's in Slovenia, Manka Juvan. She's very generous with her photographs, and I, I'm glad to be able to use them because I think they give you very striking looks at what the prisons um, seem like. And so what we have are women who are in these prisons for rumors, for slander, and there's a, a very slippery slope where an accusation can be made against a woman, and sometimes that might come about from a family dispute. It's easy to throw an accusation out there, and next thing you know, a woman can end up being convicted and serving time for a crime. So in January of 2012, there are about 400 women and girls imprisoned for crimes of immorality. And that accounts for half of all women imprisoned in Afghanistan and nearly every teenage girl in juvenile centers. That means that nearly every teenage girl in juvenile centers was there for a crime of immorality. And there are hundreds of arrests ongoing. So of course, the next natural topic is the honor killings. And I've spoken to um, another Human Rights Watch attorney who also mentioned that she went into one of the women's prisons and heard one woman's case and said, well, this is terrible. They really don't have a case against you. I'm going to set up a defense, and we're going to defend you. And the woman who was in prison said, please do not do that. 
One of the things that we see is that for some of the women imprisoned in Afghanistan, prison is actually a safer place and maybe more of a haven than home was. And so the concept of where people feel free, where people feel liberty, is a reverse of what we would imagine based on the, on the words themselves. One of the other things to take into consideration is the way that some of the laws are set up. And one of them is that the custody of the child will go to the father in the cases of a divorce. And same thing if a woman is imprisoned, the custody of the children will go to the father unless he doesn't want custody of the children. The children can stay in the prison with their mothers up until the age of seven, up until 12 in one of the prisons. But many women are fearful of walking away from a relationship that may be abusive because they're afraid of losing their children forever. So that's another pressure that's on them. One of the other things that we mentioned earlier was the illiteracy rates. And so one of the problems that was discovered in the justice system was that women who were illiterate were arrested and were sat down with an arresting officer. The arresting officer then was uh, recording some documents. And some of these women had ended up signing a form with their blue inked thumbprint on the bottom of it. And so when this attorney sat down with that arrest registry and said, well, here it is. There is a confession that has been recorded on your behalf, and you have signed it. These illiterate women have been read this confession, and they've said, I never said any of those things. And so some of the, the impetus within the justice system may be to just move the crimes through the system, find the women guilty, and whatever it may be. Um, there's also a impression of the shelters that take care of women that sometimes people call them brothels. And that's just another way of stigmatizing the women who are running away from homes. Because when you call a place a brothel, you're saying something about the women that are in it. And to say that about an Afghan woman ruins her, whether or not it's true at all. Um, one of the other points that I think really inhibits the true execution of justice is that there isn't a good terminology for rape. And so you have this blanket term of zina, which includes sex outside of marriage and will also blanketly include rape. So until you really define it, you're not admitting its existence and you're not going to be able to fully prosecute it. It is prosecuted and there have been crimes um, that really are rape that have been prosecuted, but without it being fully defined within the penal code, it's going to be fraud. So, Badambagh, it means Almond Grove, that's Afghanistan's um, capital, Kabul, their women prison. It's a cramped and cold place, but it does offer something. For many of the women, it offers a bit of community. It offers some services. There are literacy hours. Women are able to keep their children there with them until the children are seven years old. They have some access to medical care. They are away from troubling homes. They're they have access to regular meals. And like I said, there are some friendships that can develop in that place. It's not a perfect place, but it, for some women, it's a, a place better than where they were before. The other part of the legal system are the players. So we start to look at the prosecutors, at the defense attorneys, and so who are these people that are either on either side of the woman's case? More than 600 prosecutors have only a high school level education. So that tells you something about the kinds of cases that are being put out there. The defense attorneys actually come from um, internationally funded and Afghan funded legal aids societies. And so just about every woman who's accused of a crime in Afghanistan is awarded a defense attorney. But the quality of that defense is, um, it really runs the spectrum. And so some defense attorneys may actually push for a true defense, and some defense attorneys will go in and say, can you just go easy on her and not actually try to make a case for their client? So that's all the bad news. I hate to leave, you know, with any kind of writing, you don't want to end on a sad note. You got to give everybody a happy story, right? Happy ending. So I'll talk a little bit about what's happening in Afghanistan today. If you think about during the Taliban time period when no girls were allowed to go to school, now we start to enter a whole new chapter in Afghanistan's history. In today's schools, 
girls make up 36% of the students. Now that's not a perfect number, and that's not going to be the number everywhere in Afghanistan. So for sure in some of the more conservative villages, the poorer villages, it's going to be much lower than that. But overall, we're looking at 36% of students being girls. And within the justice system, there are also a lot of changes that have come into play. And these changes, you will notice, are women. Women who are being bold enough, strong enough, determined and ambitious enough to become the face of Afghanistan's tomorrow. And so you have a, a wide increase in the number of female judges and the number of female atten uh, defense attorneys. Um, we have a new attorney general who's not a woman but comes from a human rights commission. Women are heading offices of attorney general in seven out of 34 provinces, which is a good percentage. And we had the first female nominated to the Supreme Court and that ratification was missed by only six parliamentary votes. So one of the other things that one of um, that President Ashraf Ghani's first lady, Rula Ghani, recently gave a talk in DC. And one of the things that she mentioned was that all of the cases in Kabul's Almond Grove Bottom Bulk prison have recently undergone review. And she was happy to announce that more than 100 women had been released and about 100 sentences had been reduced. So there is a big initiative on the part of the current government, and there's a lot of argument about how this government is doing and this leadership is doing, of course. But one of the things that they have done is really pushed for reform within the justice system specifically for women. And they have started that right in the capital in Afghanistan. So that's a, that's a good beginning. They now have a plan to implement the same review process and they have set up additional resources to expedite it, to implement the same kind of review throughout Afghanistan and in the other women's prisons so that they can provide a more just um, system for these women. And that cases of sexual harassment, because of course within the prison system itself there are always cases and allegations of sexual harassment or inappropriate, um, uh, I guess, situations for the women that are in there, abuses of power. Those cases are going to be overseen by Anissa Rasuli, who was the, the uh, candidate for the Supreme Court justice position in Afghanistan. Now this is Maria Bashir. This is one of Afghanistan's very outspoken voices. She's the chief prosecutor general of Herat, a western city in Afghanistan. She's the first woman to hold that position. And in an interview with Annie Holmes, who's this photographer who gave us this uh, photograph, Annie Holmes recorded that Maria Bashir said she hopes she makes it into the history books when they kill her. So there is an expectation for these women that they will be receiving backlash, that they will be threatened, that their families may be threatened too, but they're taking on all of that risk because this is important enough for them to do. Women are a much bigger part of parliament, a much bigger part of government than we might have imagined them to be at this point. In 2015, Afghanistan had a 28 percentage representation by females in the parliament. And if you look at the other numbers, that makes us uh, pretty decent in our ranking. Now, part of that comes from a quota that was set up by the international community in the post-Taliban ousting period. But we've been able to maintain this. And the women who are serving in parliament are actually quite vocal. And they do take on the risks of campaigning, because it's not just that women are chosen and uh, nominated and are accepted into the parliament, but they do have to campaign for those positions too. Women are changing their roles in all aspects, and so we have Captain Nilafar Rahmani, who's Afghanistan's first female fixed wing pilot, and she also faced a lot of threats. But this is somebody who went into hiding for a time, and I believe that she's out of hiding now. But she was bold enough to take on that role. And outside of the government, outside of the military, women are doing a whole lot. And these are the things that create a sense of normalcy, that create a sense of equality, that change the way people see women, that change the, the way people define a woman's potential. So to see women as bicyclists, to see women as mountain climbers, really changes impressions. This is Ariana Saeed, who is one of the judges on Afghans The Voice. So everywhere around the world, countries are copying some of the US's top shows. Afghanistan's no different. We had Idol, and now we have The Voice, which is one of my favorites. 
And, and she's one of the judges on that show. And um, she comes on in full makeup, in full glamour. So she's sort of our Christina Aguilera. And she does a great job with it. Um, now, in artistry, too, you have Shamsia Hassani. And she is a graffiti artist. And that's something that's bold. She's crossing lines. This is outside of what you would think of when you think of an Afghan woman. And I love this picture because this just looks to me like the A-team is rolling in. And here you have a couple of women as part of it. And this really shows you that Afghan women are not relegating themselves to the housework or to the seamstress jobs. They are defiant, and they're willing to enter fields that we would not expect them to. So I'm going to start to wrap up. I will mention that, um, again, the, the photo credits are going to go to Manka Juvan, Leslie Knott, Annie Holmes, and the research for this book um, about the crimes in Afghanistan and the prison system go to Heather Barr from Human Rights Watch. And, uh, and those are the books. And before I open up to questions, and I'm checking my phone. I'm not texting. I'm checking the time here. Um, but before I open up to questions, I thought since many of you are here with creative writing classes um, and all different sites of classes, I'm going to read just the prologue from this story. So as was talked about, Zeba is a woman who is accused of murdering her husband in Afghanistan. The neighborhood sort of depend, de, de, descends upon her home when they hear a commotion, and there's her husband's crumpled body. He's got a hatchet to the back of his head and she has blood on her hands. When they ask her what's happened, she's not saying much, and she's whisked off to prison where she then meets women who are her cellmates, who are there for running away from home, for being pregnant outside of wedlock, and different kinds of crimes of immorality. And we start to pick apart what actually happened in that courtyard that day with her Afghan-American trained, uh, US trained lawyer, and her mother, who is a colorful character who kind of dabbles in black magic. So just the prologue from this book, which is written in Zeba's voice. I suppose this bloody mess might partly be my fault. How could it not be? I lived with the man. I salted the food to his taste. I scrubbed the dead skin off his back. I made him feel like a husband should. He did a few things for me, too. He would sing to me, something between a song and an apology whenever I was most upset. I could never stay mad then. Something about the way his eyebrows danced or the way his head bobbed. He was like ice to my hot moods. I would curl up against him just to feel his breath tickle the back of my neck. To think that it would all come to an end just a few feet from where we'd lain together as husband and wife and only steps away from where unholy blood had been spilled before. Our little yard with a rose bush in one corner and a clothesline running across it. It has been the theater of much gore in the last year. I question the sanity of the roses that still dare to bloom there. Those roses are deep red and would look lovely on a grave. Is that an odd thought? I think most wives imagine their husbands dying, either out of dread or out of anticipation. It's an inevitability. Why not guess at how or when it might happen? I'd imagine my husband dying a million different ways, as an old man with his children at his bedside, shot in the head by insurgents, keeled over with his hands on his unticking chest, struck by lightning on his way to somewhere he shouldn't have been going. The lightning was always my favorite. Allah forgive me for my colorful imagination. I blame my mother for that lovely bit of inheritance. Lightning would have been easier on everyone, a shocking and poetic little bolt from the heavens. It would have hurt, but only for an instant. I hate to watch anything suffer. No, I never imagined my husband dying the way he did, but what's a wife to do? Thunderstorms don't show up when you need them. Since I was a young woman, I've managed to hold myself together by stringing words into rhyme, creating order and rhythm in my head when there was none to be found in my world. Even now, in this miserable state, my mind turns a verse. My full height, my beloved husband never did see because the fool dared turn his back on me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I have stuck to my time. And at this point, we open it up to any questions uh, and any thoughts that you may have. I am open to questions both on writing, on Afghanistan, and anything. So I know that Afghanistan is a patriarchal society. And that can only change with the education of women. 
you said that education, women are now being educated. Mm -hmm. How long will it take before we begin to see some of these cultural horrible things go away? You know, where women can, can parents can be proud of having girls. Yeah, you know, I wish I could answer that question, but I will say that it's happening already. And if we take a look at some of the things that are happening um, in Afghanistan, it's hard for me to write about happy stories because that doesn't really, that's not what readers want to hear about. You want to hear about hardship. But there are a lot of happy stories in Afghanistan. There are a lot of families who are going about their business, fathers who are doing everything they can to educate their daughters, fathers who are honored to have a daughter. That exists in Afghanistan, and that's not abnormal. But there is also this undercurrent of patriarchy, and so that's what I'm writing about. But when I see how far uh, people have come in just a short period of time, if you, if you think about it, you know, Afghanistan's life expectancy is around 65 years old. It's a country that's been uh, under attack, technically under war, for about 30 plus years. We're going on a close to 40 years of unrest, civil unrest in the country. So if you have a life expectancy of 65, let's just think about you know, how many of the people in the country have ever known a real time of peace. And you need that kind of peace for civil society to really flourish and develop. So I think we have seen a lot of change happen in the past one generation, and I think a lot of that is going to continue on. It's going to continue on when you start to see that women, and they're doing more of this now, have an economic value in their society. They have jobs. They have roles outside of their home. They're contributing to the government. They are outspoken voices. When I watch the, some of the Afghan news talk shows and I, I hear women who are debating current events, um, I, I, you can tell that it's going to be, it's going to be fast. Um, I have a question for you. When women are released from prison or their sentence is overturned, is it hard for them to go back to their homes, their families? So that's a great question is what, you know, what can happen at the, at the release time? A, a woman who has been imprisoned will be stigmatized. So she's going to carry that around with her. Um, and then there's a question of well, where is she going to go? Is she going to return back to her home life? Is it her husband's home? Is it her father's home? Or where is she going to go? There's also an option of going to some of these shelters. There are several sh women's organizations that run shelters in Afghanistan. Some of them are Afghan themselves. Uh, most of them are Afghan run, if not. Um, and so there are a couple different options, and it's really going to depend on what her specific case looks like and what her family dynamics are. I have a more personal question. Sure. Um, how do you get the balance between being a pediatrician and being a novelist? How do you do that? <laughs> That's a good question. I, um, you know, when I first started writing, I was working about full time as a pediatrician, and and writing was a hobby that I started. I didn't know what was going to become of it, and you know, at some point, hobbies kind of can't take up too much time because that doesn't make sense in your overall schedule. Um, but once I got my first book accepted for publication, I started to write a second one. And there was sort of you know, me putting a little bit more time into writing. I've cut back a little bit on my hours as a pediatrician. At this point now, I have so many commitments revolving around, you, know, you, you don't just write the story. You then have to be part of the revising process. You have to be part of the marketing process. I have speaking engagements, travel that was mentioned. And so all of that takes up quite a bit of time, and I have to keep writing if I want to keep my agent and my publisher happy. Um, so I've cut back quite a bit on my pediatrics. I haven't let go of it completely because it's important to me. I worked hard to be able to do that, and I want to practice pediatrics on more than just my children at home. So, so I do keep my feet in it. But I, the way I'm able to do it is really with a supportive family and with um, really good support at home, people that I really trust to take care of my children. Yeah, no doubt that um, being a pediatrician would that that'd be amazing just in itself, and then to also be a novelist. Um, my question is actually about yeah. My question is actually about um, not not necessarily the balance, but how do you feel you are impacting the lives you are now versus um, the communication you do when you are a novelist? Like, do you prefer, in some sense, the actual? I'm doing this right now, and this person is going to be affected immediately, or do you feel like overall the impact of writing and the likes is more important to you, and that's yeah. why you push for being a novelist? That's a really smart question. I think you've, you've picked up on really what my day is like when I do one versus the other, and yes, when I'm a pediatrician, 
it's one-on-one -on -one interaction, and I do happen to work in an emergency room setting, so it's you know a child coming in with a fever, concerned parents, and it's immediate what I do with them. Whatever happens is going to happen in the next one to two hours. And you know when they walk away and they're comforted or they're relieved, or at least we have a bit of a plan and they know what to do next, that's very gratifying. Um, and it's a very immediate gratification for me. On the other hand, when I write, of course, I may spend two months writing something. Um, I may spend actually nine months writing something, and no one's going to see it. So that nine months is me having to be moved enough and believe enough in what I'm writing to keep going at it. But when I do get it out there, and when I do find the opportunity to communicate with readers, and because of social media, because of the internet, I get emails from people around the world, and I'm completely humbled to be doing so, but I get emails from people who, I got one email from a woman in New York who just said she read my book, and I keep in mind that these are fictional characters I've created. Yes, they're rooted in a reality, but these are fictional characters. And I had a woman who said that she had a very rough home, and she read my story, and she was able to be inspired by Rahima, and she felt like, you know what, I can actually pick myself up and move along. And I get one of those emails, and I'm good, you know? because that's something that means so much to me, especially when it's a younger person that's writing to me that way. And I get a lot of these, or if I get emails, one of my books is about refugees. I'll get emails from people who say they never looked at refugees in that way before. They never in imagined that these were people who left homes, professional lives, who had everything destroyed, and that they are all of a sudden having a whole sense of compassion that they never had before. So when I see things like that, and I know that you know, this one story reaches that one person, that one person is going to go out and, and reach some other people, it's, uh, it's an impact that I, I'm just astounded by personally. Um, sorry, one more question. Yes. Um, you, okay, sorry. Um, you touched lightly on the fact that this is happening um, culturally, like this is more than just Afghanistan, and I feel like this is more personal because this is where your parents are from, of course, but growing up in New York, you must have experienced people from all around the world. So I was wondering if you will continue, if possible, your education in other countries and writing books about not only um, a person from Afghan Afghanistan, but also someone, um, say, Nigeria, or mm. what they're feeling, because I feel like you're the way you're able to word things and construct ideas would be very valuable to the majority of people. And if they're able to see that by not only your viewpoint, but um, various, I feel like that would be constructive and good for the environment. Well, I, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, that, that means a lot to me. Um, you know, I write about Afghanistan because I thought it's an interesting context. But I've always wanted the themes of those stories to be a, a a, a chance for people to reflect inward also and to think about you know, how we're doing things in Afghanistan. And one of the things that I always talk about is, yeah, in this book I'll talk about how women in Afghanistan are, are imprisoned for crimes of immorality and this reputation concept. But next thing you know, in my newsfeed pops up an article about a girl who um, says that she was sexually assaulted on a college campus and it's not investigated and we start to ask, or we start to ask questions about what was she wearing, how much did she have mm -hmm. to drink tonight, and so if you take a look at that, we are again asking questions of how much is she to blame for this crime that happened to her? And so it's the same concept in my world. If I compare these two countries, these two situations, but I'm thinking here again is, you know, in one case we may be talking about honor in Afghanistan, and in our context, we may be talking about shame. Mm -hmm. But you know, two sides of the same coin, if you ask me. So I, I think that, you know, for me, I have written a lot about Afghanistan. I do, of course, I, as a writer, want to spread my wings and talk about other contexts. I probably will jump to the United States, because it's more comfortable for me to write about what I know. And we are, luckily, we have awesome Nigerian authors. Um, that I've had the pleasure of reading. But I think you know, we do try to give authenticity to a voice, and that's something that's really important for me. I would not feel comfortable writing a Nigerian character at this point, because I haven't walked in that person's shoes. And that's not to say that I couldn't do it, but right now I don't feel like I would do it well enough for me to take on that responsibility, because it's a huge responsibility. 
but I think to write about what's happening in the United States is something that's important to me because this is my backyard. And I'm, I'm very invested in what's happening here. I'm very invested in what's happening to girls here. Yes. So r real quickly, excuse me, because I know we're running out of time. Um, it, is there much of a difference between the situation with women in the rural areas and in the cities? And um, how do those equate? And then the other question is, the United States stayed involved in Afghanistan for a long time because of the women. The idea was if we pulled out, the women were going to be um, stranded. And so what it, is your feeling about that in terms of the role of the United States, um, you know, going in in war and going beyond? So, you know, the, the question with the United States involvement is, um, is, is a really, really tricky one. We definitely have the, the, the message that the United States went in to free Afghan women, to liberate them. And we have seen that happen. And so many of, when there was talk about the, the withdrawal of American troops and of Western troops from Afghanistan, many of the women's rights organizations were really anxious about that because they felt that they, all the gains that they had made would be would just really fall apart pretty quickly in the wake of the withdrawal. Um, and to some extent, we have seen that the Taliban are still present. They're still making their presence known. They still have attacks here and there in the country. And they have, at some points, actually taken cities briefly until the Afghan National Forces are able to reclaim those, um, those territories. So, and the women do feel that constantly. There is that threat lurking in the background. But we have to move forward. And one of the things that Afghanistan has to do, if it wants to create a society that's going to work for itself, it's got to be its own agent of change. And so at some point, you cannot have the presence of American troops there any longer. And I'm also speaking as an American. When I think about American troops that are there, I'm thinking about my neighbors. I'm thinking about the sons and daughters of the people that I work with, their loved ones. And it's hard to deny what a sacrifice that is. No matter how you feel about war, I think that's a policy judgment versus you know, the people who are actually serving there. Those are individuals, those are human lives, who are people who are away from their families, away from their children, um, to, to participate and do that. So, uh, and, and sometimes there is a question of what kind of an impact we've had. There's been a lot of money that's been thrown into Afghanistan and a lot of debate about how efficacious those, those attempts have been to benefit the country. But I think with anything that's directed at the women in Afghanistan, it's going to have to really come from within. And yes, the, the conditions for Afghan women are very different countryside to cities. Um, it just it depends locally what's going on, but in general, countryside villages tend to be more conservative. Yes? I don't know who was here first. Were you here first? Okay. Um, I actually, I'm not sure if um, you want to answer. Um, it's kind of a little personal, but um, do you think that religion has an empathic role uh, in any um, not that much developed countries that has uh, pressure on girls. I'm not talking just, uh, just about Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, in experience, I, uh, I saw like maybe religious um, families like um, Christians or uh, any other religion families have more pressure on girls. And do you think uh, it's um, just um, putting the pressure on education part is not enough to change the society? Thank yeah, you. So that's a great question, is the intersection of religion and, um, and the women's rights movement. And I think if you, and I, you know, being that I trained in New York, I had opportunity to interact with people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds. And in my observations, when you look at any religious group, when you get more conservative and more conservative into any religion, the patriarchy flourishes and the patriarchy comes out. And you know, in, in very 
conservative societies even within the United States. I mean, down in, the, in some communities, we've had purity balls where girls go to a formal dance with their father and vow that they will you know, stay virgins until they get married, and they do that for their fathers, which also has that same kind of a root of placing that burden on girls. So I think there's a lot more universal in these themes. The way it, the, the, the pressure on girls plays out, I think, has a different flavor depending on where in the world you are or you know, what language you speak. But um, I think there's a lot of universality to it. Yes. Hi. So you um, emphasize the need for um, educating women and girls um, in order to um, change the culture and society. What about the men? I mean, they're. <laughs> what do you think that, what can people do about that? I mean, you're trying to, in essence, change an entire culture and their way of life. And just changing part of it, I don't feel like is as effective as um, getting everyone to see, you know, th these different facets that allow women to really live a, a liberating life. And of course, yeah. religion plays into that. Right. So I think the question is, how do you change a man's view of mm -hmm. what a woman's worth is, right? Because that's, these are the, the people who are, who are affecting that impression on women. So yeah, how are you going to change that? Well, a, a few different things are going to come to mind. But they do have to see women with a different value in their society. So I think by giving education to girls, you know, th those are the girls who are going to become vocal, they're going to become leaders, they're going to prove that a woman's potential is beyond what those individuals may believe in. Now that's not to say, of course, let me preface this by saying that not all men in Afghanistan are misogynistic, not all men in Afghanistan believe that women should stay in the home. Again, there are really supportive men in the country, but now we're also speaking on a broader basis. There has to be an, a, a widespread movement, a community-wide movement, that says these things are not OK to do to a woman. Violence is not OK to use on a woman. These kinds of judicial proceedings are not OK for women. And, and that changes the understanding within the community of men. There have to be conversations within households, too. right? So you have to have parents that are teaching their children that my sons have the same value as my daughters, and that they're not better than my daughters but they're worth the same to me. Now, part of the problem is that much of the patriarchy has been internalized by women. So we need a generation of women who are educated, empowered, who can teach their sons that, who can teach their daughters that. And we need the men to see what's happening in the communities around them. We need women to be visible again. For those men, those fathers, to teach their sons the same thing. And you know, the more educated a woman is, the less likely is to get married early, the less likely she is to have children early, the less likely she is to have complications of childbirth early, the more likely her children are to live, and the more likely her children are to go to school. So I think by targeting the women and the girls and educating them, that's really the key. But you can't do that in the absence of involving the men, because of course, they have to be the partners. Uh, but there's really no way to do it. It's, it's impossible to do it just one or just the other. Thank you. Yes. 